George V was the sailor king. He had been in the Royal Navy. It's also not well known by a lot of people that he was euthanized. Hi, I'm George the Antique Nomad. Come with me as I wander the country in search of valuable vintage, amazing antiques, and cool collectibles. We'll buy, sell, and trade at antique malls, shops, and shows, estate sales, flea markets, thrift stores, anywhere people go to find really interesting things that just aren't made anymore. So come on, let's go. So when I was in Petoskey, Michigan doing a show a few weeks ago, a friend of mine was talking about where he stops on his way down to Florida, and he mentioned this antique mall, Gateway Antique Mall in Rossville, Georgia, which is just outside Chattanooga, Tennessee. Chattanooga has a lot of stores, and I've been to some of those before, but I have not ever been to this one, and I thought, well, he gets good merchandise, and he recommended it, so I'm going to stop by and take a look on my next trip to Florida, and here we are. So like a lot of southern antique pavilions, this is in an old mall that has expired for other uses and is being readapted. I see there's another store in the corner called Antiques by the Fountain, and that's good. A lot of antique places clustered together make a bigger attraction and usually mean more opportunity to find things. So I'm excited to see this place and we'll go in and take a look. I gotta put on the bandana and look like a bandit. There we go. We've got a lot of showcases, and showcases sometimes have a lot of the better stuff. It's worth showing this because LEGO old and more recent sets are pretty valuable in the marketplace now for a lot of people. And you'll notice on some of the tags here that they say how complete they are, meaning somebody went through and tried to figure out what pieces were missing, which is important because kids played with these and a lot of stuff does disappear. We've got superheroes, Indiana Jones. A lot of these are newer, but when you go back to the earlier Legos, and Legos do date back to the late 1960s, there are some pretty hard ones to find. A lot of the 1980s sets particularly are expensive right now. I knew I should have stopped when it said stop, and now that thing is ripped off the side of the bus. But hey, it's there for us to enjoy now. A lot of people like these because they're ornamental or they'll use them, well, in private roads and things like that where the city, state, and county don't provide signage. People have to get their own. This is an old slop bucket, but it's nice because it's got the original label that tells us it's from the 1950s. Kanawha porcelain enamelware. The same durable titanium finish used on the best stoves and refrigerators. And indeed, Fletcher Enamel Company would have been using the same enamel that they used on stoves and refrigerators back then. It was thick and durable, and that's why a lot of people like these things now. This one, which appears to have really never been used, is priced at $18, which is not bad because it's in perfect condition. This piece is $70, and if it works, that's not bad either. This is a Gem Dandy, and Gem Dandy is a churn, but this is an electric churn. This is, it says right there, the Gem Dandy electric churn from Birmingham, Alabama. And that was a big improvement because churning was not a lot of fun. You had to make your way through a whole pile of thickening butter and cream and all that sort of stuff, and it was really quite a workout. So the electric churn was a big improvement that came out about 1940. In the late 70s Sears catalogs you would have seen Merry Mushrooms and you would have seen this guy, the Frog Canister set. And this one's nice because it's the whole set for $40, pretty good price, and they seem to be in good shape. These were made in Korea and Japan. This one says copyright 1978, made in Japan for Sears and Roebuck. And so these wares tended to be pretty thin and they chipped easily. So seeing this in good shape is a nice find. And for a collector, that's really a very good price. Here's a copper fire extinguisher. These have really gone up in interest and in value over the last five to 10 years. It used to be you could pretty routinely find these in the $50 range. This one's priced at 119. That's the price I see on them primarily nowadays. It's got a 1912 patent date, and if we could unscrew this cover, we'd see whether it has its original sleeve in it, but I don't think so because I see a drill hole in the top. Some people want them to be complete with everything in them. 
they would still work if you wanted to heft one of those around. A lot of people use them just for decoration or for lamp bases these days. I'll show this really quickly because they have such a wide variety. These are newer Barbie collectibles. There's everybody from the X-Files Barbie and Ken to Star Trek Barbie and Ken. I think it's funny that Barbie looks like somebody from the X-Files. But the thing I want to point out about these is that with a few exceptions, I mean here we have Barbie Baywatch. And it's funny, as exaggerated as Barbie's figure is, it holds not a candle to Pamela Lee Anderson's. The thing with these Barbies is that they made a lot of these editions. FAO Schwartz and some of those toy companies when they were in business just had thousands of these in stock. And so they're cool because they have a wide variety of things. You can see various ethnic and worldwide Barbies. You can see winter collections and space camp. So Barbie gets to do a lot of different things. But with very few exceptions, these are fairly common and not of great value because with the exception of the one that talked and said math class is hard, which was decried by women's rights groups and then taken off the market, most of these are pretty common. The collectors who are really into Barbie and pay big prices want things from the 1970s and preferably the 60s. Now here's a bunch of the toy trucks, Nylint and other companies. You can tell a 1980s truck because in the 1980s, trucks still had this very abrupt front end. They hadn't curved them off to drop the wind resistance yet. So that tells you that this piece is going to be 30 to 40 years old. You'll also notice that in the Tonka car carrier here from the 1960s. Again, a very abrupt front end. Now compare that to these K-Line trucks where the nose is rounded off. That's going to tell you that these date to the 1990s or after. <clears throat> and that makes a difference because most of the collectors right now are people who grew up in the 70s and 80s and are nostalgic for those eras. And so the values on those older ones are going to be higher than the newer ones. With all the controversy surrounding ethnic representations in advertising right now, I thought I'd show this piece. This is from 1946, and this was advertising for Thomas Products. Thomas Products used the Native American with the teepee as its logo. This was an advertising bank, so you would take it home and remember the product. This is priced at $14 after the discount, which is a pretty good deal. If the paint was a little better, I would definitely buy it at that price. It's interesting to see sports teams changing their names and some of these types of things happening now in the marketplace. After a long time and a lot of pressure, there really does seem to be a sea change going on as far as the way that ethnic groups are represented in the media. Well, we do find some things that are old in this particular space. United Motor Service sign here from Detroit Walker and Company, that is legit. It is the old enameling. You can see a little bit of chipping. It's also priced at 1200 which is a pretty full price, but there's a lot of interest in these these days. The Texaco is priced at 950 and this one here is a good one. Evan Rood and Elto Outboard Motors. Anything boating related is really desirable now. There's a recent episode of American Pickers where he goes through and finds a bunch of old boat signs and he buys one enamel, one painted metal, and one plastic and he paid good money for all of them because as he said anything with a boat on it sells really well and people with boats generally have extra money that's why they have a boat. Well this case has some older pieces. Sweeter and Sugar is either Holt Howard or PY or one of those Japanese companies and that would have been for probably saccharin back in that day, back when people were willing to use saccharin before they found out it was really not good for you. They've got old coffee canisters. This set in the back is cute because it's got that green holder. I have to say they are asking all the money, as they say on Antiques Roadshow in England, because they're asking 300 for that set, which to me is a bit of a push. 
Here's some cute Japanese themed salt and pepper shakers from the 1950s and 60s era. They took up where Treasure Craft left off with the themed items. So you've got the fish in the creole and the bird on the nest and the bee on the flower. Very sweet. And then the Royal Copley Spaniel with a couple of friends behind there. And then in this case, lots of angels and Christmas ladies doing their shopping. Some of them have the spaghetti, which is that flocking that you see. Let's bring this in where you can see it a little better, I think, on her. This little girl that holds the candle on her head is by Lefton. She's from about 1970. Transportation related collectibles really depend on your taste. Lots of people like Chevrolet because when this sign was made back in the circa 1930 era, Chevrolet would have been the biggest car company. It's priced at $1,050. You can see that it's in pretty good overall shape with just a few chips. Now this is really neat. I haven't seen this before and I know a fellow who does nothing but boy scouting and he's never owned this and he's been a dealer for 30 years so this is a hard to find piece. Safety first Boy Scouts of America. Join your local troop. And with that lettering with the exclamation point at an angle like that, that is something we see right about 1930. So this, I'm going to try to step back so you can see the whole thing, is a very unusual enameled sign and it's priced at 1200. I suspect it's worth every penny because it's not something that we see often and there are a lot of scouting collectors. Shot glasses are something I personally have collected for a long time. I'll show you a few things about them to help you date them. When you see them short like this and stout with a thick bottom, those are typically 1950s, 60s, and 70s. When they get to be tall and skinny, people's appetites increased. These are more contemporary. I usually avoid those. People really like these with the gilding from the 1960s that went along with the glassware sets of that time with the green and gold. People will really put up with barware not being dishwashable in a way that they won't with tableware. And I think it's because you don't use the barware as often and it's just fun to have something glamorous. We're gonna try to show some of the things in this case because he's got a lot of neat stuff the iron push-up candlestick holder. There's a whale oil lamp. If you look at the burner, this is made of pewter and it's a chamber stick to be carried at night. The burner is a different type than on the kerosene with that pointed top there. Neat old tankard that someone carved around 1900. Little collapsible travel cup. Those are collectible in their own right. Here we've got an old auto or buggy lantern from about 1900 up on that stand and some tall brass hurricane candles just a lot of fun things they you see a lot of brown in here but a lot of things were brown and that's because this is what people could get wooden metal inkwell set that swan-necked copper teapot is interesting, and then there's a brass telescope to the left of it, priced at 155. Nice shelf full of pottery here. We have the McCoy piece in the middle here, the Jardinier in that nice greenish color. A cool hall airflow teapot, only $24. The prices have really come down on those. Fun area to collect. Maybe we should be drinking more tea these days. They say it's got good stuff in it. This piece says McCoy on the bottom. This is McCoy's Harmony line. You would have seen various colors, including orange stripes and others in the 1960s in that pattern. And then down here, I wanted to show this piece, which is also McCoy, is an anvil. $22. That's an unusual one. We don't really see the McCoy anvil come up much at all, but this one's got a big chip in it. So that's unfortunate. And then below it, 
we have the woodland moss color of Francoma pottery. Woodland moss was popular in the 1960s into about 1980. It's this blue that has the variegation that they would do using the rutile glazes. People are more familiar with the prairie green and the desert sand that have the variegation, but the woodland moss was another one that they used the rutile chemical to make it pool up with browns and darken along the edges. It was a one-step process and that meant that Francoma was able to make a lot of things that had a nice look without a lot of extra effort or glazing and that was a big advantage to them. They became quite large and very popular in the 1970s. You can see also the boot planter is Francoma. This is a wall pocket and the acorns. These are wall pockets as well and these are the Ada clay. See how it's tan on the clay? That is the first clay. Ada, Oklahoma had tan clay deposits and that's where the first factory was. They then moved to Sepulpa and in the Sepulpa area they had red clay deposits. So the Sepulpa pieces which start in 1956 have a different color than the Ada clay pieces on the back. And then in the 1990s, they would actually add a little bit to it so it was more of a pink color. Collectors do tend to favor the Ada clay over the later clays if the piece was made back in that time. And since it's a political year, let's show <coughs> one of Francoma's most enduring lines, which were the political mugs. They came out every year starting in 1969 when they said Nixon Agnew and that was because they gave them out at the inaugural and 500 people who went to the inaugural ball got the Francoma mugs and they were popular so they put them in the line. The first year is one of the more valuable ones. Every time there was a new administration the following year for the inaugural, this is 1977, it would have the name of the winners on it, Carter Mondale in this case. Now, you see the Francoma mark on the bottom. This one was made in an off year, 1983. There wasn't a presidential election, so it doesn't have the name of the president on it. But there is indeed a Reagan-Bush one. This one is 1988. You'll notice the color of the clay. I was talking earlier about they added something and it became more of a pinky brown. This is ex an example of that. One of the most valuable, in fact probably the most valuable, is the one that says Gore Lieberman. They made 500 of them for the inaugural ball and they had to make 500 with each presidential team because the presidential election had not been settled by the time they had to produce them. They made 500 for Gore Lieberman. The Supreme Court made the ruling that gave the election to George W. Bush and Dick Cheney. And as a result, there were 500 Gore Lieberman mugs that did not go to Washington, D.C., so Francoma just sold them in their outlet store. They now sell for several hundred dollars a piece. So while I'm thinking of it, please comment in the space below here and also hit the thumbs up button to like this video. If you haven't subscribed, click the subscribe button below. Also, hit the bell below to be notified of new videos coming every Monday and Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern. And thank you so much for following along. Let's go back to this video. This dealer has a lot of wall pockets, and I think wall pockets are a lot of fun. They were especially popular right after the Second World War. You see them as early as the 30s. They were made all over the world, but a lot were made in America during and right after the war. This is Walker Potteries out of Los Angeles with the grapes, priced at 14. That's a pretty fair price for that. I like these cups and saucers here. The variegation on the glaze is fun. No indication of the maker on these. A lot of these were made by very small mom and pop operations and were not necessarily marked. And if they haven't been shown in the California or some of the other pottery reference books, we don't necessarily know who made them. So these the dealer has marked the two fruit ones as McCoy, but I took one of them off the wall. They clearly came from the same factory. Treasurecraft made similar in Southgate, but they don't have the veins in the leaves, and theirs are clearly marked. 
But this dealer has them marked as McCoy, but we actually see a Y mark on the back. That may be for Yona of California, but it does not look like a McCoy mark to me. And then this one is not marked, but this is Royal Copley. And the little angel is $22. Most of the wall pockets are in the 15 to 25 range. This shape here is Japanese. We see a lot of those. Sometimes you would see pairs like these Royal Copley, the boy with the fishing pole and the girl with the hat. Another Japanese one here with the Lester Ware is this swan. They're a fun area to collect and you can fill a wall space with them, have a lot of fun, and they don't cost a lot of money. They're great to put flowers in, but people will sometimes put other things. You'll see them near a sewing table with a pair of scissors in them, for example. This one here is rather fancy and I think a pretty good deal for $18 because it is Lester Ware. It's Japanese, but the ship is a different style than we see. And it's got the Made in Japan mark from right before the Second World War. So indeed, the Japanese actually should get credit. They and the Czechs actually did a lot of the first of the wall pockets. And the American companies came along during the war years when we weren't importing from those countries and did their versions. I wanted to show these little novelties because these are marked Occupied Japan. And Occupied Japan is a very distinctive mark. Now you can see they varied in quality. This one's a little better painted. She's trying to look like a European figurine. And it says very clearly on the bottom, Made in Occupied Japan. The reason it says Occupied Japan is we started to rebuild the Japanese economy right after the Second World War. And there was great fear amongst the Allied leaders that if we didn't put Occupied on there, that Americans, because of resentment over the war, would not buy these wares. And they needed us to buy from them so that they could put money back into the Japanese economy. Now this one came after this one just says Japan. Occupied Japan is specifically 1947 to 52 only, and then the occupation ended, and at that point, the occupied mark comes off. Japanese hate, hate, hate these wares marked Occupied Japan, and in the 1980s, when Japan's economy was surging, there were reports at antique stores, including one I worked at, of Japanese people buying Occupied Japan marked items and taking them out in the parking lot and smashing them. Now this is a fairly simple item by them, but I want to show you this mark. It's in a 50% off booth, and I think I might just get it because that makes it $12.50. This company is better known for its figural wares, but this is a company called Deruta from Italy. Deruta is a name to look for. This particular piece, like their other pieces, are hand-painted, they have a faience style glaze. It's an interesting motif, I think, with the winged griffin. Old hubcaps are not something to turn your nose up at these days. Some of them are pretty valuable because people are restoring the old cars. It's nice when you can get sets. If the paint's in good condition, that's important. The 56 DeSoto particularly was a beautiful car, and DeSotos are very collectible now. At $6 each, these are pretty good deals. Some of these would sell for a lot more online, so something to look into for resellers or car park collectors, of which there are a lot. These beautiful European porcelains. Right up there in quality is RS Prussia. Before Germany was Germany, it was Prussia, and that's why these older pieces are marked RS Prussia. They were very popular in the 1980s and 90s. This bowl, which is $120 now with this lovely blown out designed blank, the blank being the shaped piece without the transfer wear and hand painting, would have sold for about $250 30 years ago. Very pretty transfer wear. The swan motif is particularly desired, but the open roses are nice as well. This is just a fun way to display that I thought I would show. They've built a little trading post, the Daniel Boone trading post inside of this antique mall. And they're showing taxidermy and foxtails and those sorts of things, along with 
a lot of original old advertising, not reproductions up there, that you can see. Old lanterns. It's just a fun way to create a showcase for a certain type of item that looks good in this context because this is the sort of context where you might find these items in a collection or in an old barn find. So it just creates an atmosphere. This would have been a door push. These actually came off of the doors, like old screen doors on the front of old general stores and country stores. However, this one is a reproduction. It is too perfect. It has no wear. These would have been banged against for years. The other clue is look at the paint. It's really kind of imprecise. These would have originally been airbrushed by a machine. They would have all been perfect. So that tells us that this is not a real one. Plus the door handle clearly has never been touched by human hands. It should have wear spots. It should have grease. It might have corrosion from being on the outside of a building. It's priced at $169. If it was a real one, it would probably be worth double that. On the other hand, something that is real is this old sewing machine supply cabinet, it appears. We'll walk around these old salt glaze jugs from North Carolina and take a look at this. This one appears to be from the 1800s. It's had some renovations. But it does have the original hinges. It does have the interior. You can tell this is older because the interior didn't get a lot of air near the bottom because it would have been full of stuff. So the bottom is very clean and white looking. When you go up the sides, the closer to the lid, the darker the wood gets. That is because air gets under the lid and so you have some oxidation of the wood. So this one does appear to be legitimate. And that's important because at 290, this is priced right if it is the real thing. It would not be priced right if that was a reproduction. Lots of people are aware of Wade pottery figures that came in the red rose tea that were little animals and critters and sometimes fairy tale characters and that sort of thing. But a lot of people have not seen these items. These are also by Wade. And these are from a couple of different sets. One is called Whimsy on the Y, which was a little fictitious town that they made with all these different little buildings. These are priced at $10 to $15 each and a couple in the 18 range, which are kind of typical selling prices. They also did a Wade Irish village called Bally Wim. So that was a different series. And you have the Bally Wim house here, for example, but this one has it marked more clearly. So there's Wade Ireland on that. And then the ones that are from Whimsy on the Y are marked Wade England because Wade had factories in both England and Ireland, or at least they did when they were producing. This is nice to see. We don't find a lot of booths with old tabletop radios. And this one has quite a few. They've got the old Traveler clock radio here. That's going to be from about 1950, as is the old Radiola. These are priced anywhere from $50 to $75, it appears. This one is a General Electric, back when they were the king of housewares. This one is another General Electric from 1947 with the golden dial clock, and it had the alarm in it. They all have a little different style to them. Later on, here's a GE from about 1970. These don't sell as high. This one's priced at $20, but they tend to work just as well. There's an RCA from the 60s, about the same price. There's a Westinghouse radio. It was a time that everybody had to have a radio in their house like this because that's how you got news and information. It's what woke you up in the morning. This is, of course, before cell phones, which serve all of those purposes now. But a lot of people still enjoy the look of the radio, and there are still lots of good shows on the radio. People are starting to get interested in these as well. This is a Panasonic weather radio, so you could get the weather band, FM, and AM. Some of these also get police bands, so you can listen to the police scanners, and there are people who enjoy them for that reason. This one's from about 1973, priced at $40 after the discount. Here's a bunch of HO rail stuff. 
HO is this scale, which is probably the most common and popular nowadays in the 1950s and earlier O scale and the larger scales were more popular, but HO lets you get a little more detail into your vignettes that you build because you can get more stuff in a smaller space. The engines here are going to vary in value depending on who made them. Tyco was typically, and I believe Bachman actually towards the end too, were typically the least expensive when they were new and they were not as good quality. Athern and some of those companies made better stuff. AHM, you'll see here, AHM. That little steam engine, it's priced at 15. I have to say I usually get about 25 for those, so that's a pretty good price. I sell a lot of these in Centralia, Washington, which is a big antique town and has a main stop on the route between Seattle and Portland. This Athern label is from the 1970s. Walters is another good company, Atlas. Tyco, again, less expensive. They did not have couplers that were separate, so people were not as interested in them when they got more sophisticated. Roundhouse is a good company. Globe is an older company that we don't see as much. I believe they were gone by the 1970s. Here's an older Athern box. This has Los Angeles 44, so that's pre-zip code. So that tells you that that has a little bit more age. Anyway, there's a lot of collectors for these sorts of things, including the kits, especially if they were not used because a lot of the people who set up these railroads now want to do their own modeling, and so they want the original kit that they can build themselves. And you'll see prices anywhere from about four to $10 each for rolling stock, which is what they call the cars and cabooses and such. And in the 25 to $35 for the average engine. But if you find an engine made of all brass, those were very expensive new, they're expensive now. Well, this is fun because this is from about 1950 and it's got an art modern style to it. It cleans, it lubricates. It's Amico Permalube motor oil on one side and on the other side, it's clean restrooms. So you had the chance to clean your car and yourself while you were there. That was a pretty good deal. And then I wanted to show these because with the aging of the Royals, we will see a new generation coming along at some point. But a lot of these are Queen Elizabeth. You will see Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip's coronation on the plate in the back there. They made Prince Philip walk six paces behind her. She argued otherwise, but they would not allow it because that was tradition. Royalty, I'm sure, is wonderful for having lots of wealth, but it seems like you have a lot of restrictions on your life. Here's William and Kate Middleton. The little child's cup is Prince Charles. In 1953, when Queen Elizabeth ascended to the throne, he was five years old. She's still on the throne and he is 72. I suspect he'll be like King Edward. He might get 10 years as monarch. King Edward was replaced after his death by his son, George V. George V and Queen Mary are shown in this reticulated plate here at their coronation, which took place in 1910. George V was the sailor king. He had been in the Royal Navy. It's also not well known by a lot of people that he was euthanized. And then of course, this is the coronation of King Edward. Edward was the abdicator who followed George V. He was the oldest son. He wanted to marry Wallace Simpson, an American socialite and divorcee. And because of that, as well as his political views, he actually supported Hitler at one point. He was pretty much drummed out of the monarchy and replaced by Queen Elizabeth's father. And here's Elizabeth during the Silver Jubilee in 1977. It's this historic journey that makes commemoratives from the royalty interesting to people and collectible. There we see the Duke of Edinburgh when he was not yet ascended to the throne. And that is a different color of Wedgwood blue that we don't see very often. That would be from the middle 1930s. In the back we see a plate that says 
to commemorate the visit of the King and Queen to Canada in 1939. The King and Queen coming to Canada in 1939 was a big deal because they were raising money and support for the war effort. The war started in 1939, Hitler invaded Poland and that drew England into the war. The United States was officially neutral, but Canada was not, and Canada ended up supporting the war effort quite vigorously. The United States supported it tacitly, and were drawn in, of course, when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. But the reason for them coming to Canada, in part, was so that they could also lobby American support. And then behind, we see a transferware plate that shows the ascension of George V to the throne in 1911. He was coronated in 1911. He ascended to the throne in 1910. Thanks for joining me. Bye for now. This is George the Antique Nomad on Periscope, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and here on YouTube Mondays and Wednesdays. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining me again in the fun and fascinating antique community here where online meets the real world. Please click the subscribe button below Click the bell to be notified when new videos upload. Leave a comment below and hit thumbs up to like this video. Links to our online social media daily posts and our items for sale are in the description. This is George at The Antique Nomad. Bye for now!